In the whole history of uh, humanity, there have always been presidents and dukes and earls and nobility and sultans and warlords. In other words, powerful people who could do what they want for the people who actually worked. And along comes democracy, though. And in the democracy, all of us get to come together and make rules that them dukes and them earls and them sultans have to abide by. That's what democracy is about. The only reason we have democracy is so that the ordinary people can tell the big and the mighty what they have to do. They cannot pollute our air. They cannot kill our jobs. They cannot send them overseas because we can make laws that say, no, you can't. And it works just fine unless we don't participate. And it works just fine unless they can use their money to manipulate, deceive, and distract. And let me tell you, they have figured out that if they can distract us, suppress us, deny us, and trick us and lie to us, then maybe they can manipulate this democracy thing to their favor once again. Well, the idea of fighting back Wall Street is that, no, we're not going for it. Not this time. The idea of taking on Wall Street is that us regular folks, you know, the folks who bake the cars, the folks who clean the building, the folks who teach the classes, you know what I mean? The folks who run the pipe and the, wire, and the wiring, we are going to use our democratic prerogative to make the high and mighty on Wall Street obey the laws in the interest of the public, not themselves. That is the basic concept. So we need a resurgence of democratic participation. We need a resurgence of activism. Yeah, we need to get out on the picket lines, of course, and we also need to march and might even need to sit in, may even need to get arrested sometimes. But we also have got to be writing the rules. And we also need to be talking to our neighbors and telling our friends that this is our democracy, this is our air, these are our jobs, this is our country, there are airwaves, and the people who try to profit from them are going to act like they are ours, the public's property. And that's what's going on today. Let me tell you, these people are trying to rule our political system with their money. They're trying to get us to pass rules to help them make more money, which they use to influence our political system even more. And the time for that is absolutely over. It's going to take fierce and committed leadership, particularly from our union sector. You know, my man, President Trump, thank you for being here and thank for all you do. I want everybody in this room to know when we were fighting off trade promotion authority, and we, we put up a good fight, and we may win this battle yet. Mark my words. Some people who wanted to push this trade promotion authority, you know, literally get Congress, the representatives of the people, to hand over their constitutional authority to the president, which, by the way, they need that law because if they didn't, the constitutional authority is in Congress, right? It's in Congress because that's where it belongs. It's in Congress because the people who represent the people are the ones who listen to the people's stories about their jobs being offshored, about how they're going to be, how, how trade is going to impact them. That's why that authority is in the Constitution. But they want us, they got this clever idea for us to take our power and hand it over to the president, who's not taking into consideration the local impact of these trade deals. And they said, oh, we're going to have the president come talk about this. Well, you know what? You couldn't have, you couldn't, I couldn't contain the smile on my face when I saw Rich Trumka walk through that door to stand up and represent the people of, the, of America and talk about how trade was impacting us. But it's bigger than trade, isn't it, Rich? It's also about financial reform. And I'm on the Financial Services Committee, brother, and every single day, a day does not come, the doors do not open when they're not in there trying to take down everything to protect the American consumer. I want you to know that the Consumer Financial Products Bureau has returned, and I gotta look at my staff to make sure my number's right, over $12 billion 
to the American consumer. $12 billion. $12 billion to veterans, right? $12 billion to student, Congressman Velasquez. $12 billion to minority buyers of cars who are jacked up more because they are minorities and women. This is why we need financial reform. Yes, Richard Trumka can kick their butt and make them pay you more during the day, but when you get off work and you go to the store and you want to buy something, they reach it in your pockets. We've also got to have some defense as consumers too, consumers of financial products. Now, one of the things we got to do, and I took notes so I'd get it right, is we absolutely must pass a financial a financial transaction tax. <clears throat> you know, I joined together with some other folks, and Bernie Sanders is one of them, but there's many others. And this Inclusive Prosperity Act would restore the financial transactions tax of this country, which would generate $300 billion a year in revenue. This could make the days come to an end when Nidia and I are trying to scrape together pennies so we can keep a Head Start program. This could bring to the, to the end the days when Nitty and I and other members of Congress are fighting to keep Meals on Wheels alive. Meals on Wheels, man. They want to cut Meals on Wheels. Oh, no, don't tax us big high rollers. Cut Meals on Wheels. Cut Pell Grants. Cut research to figure out how to do something about your mother's Parkinson's. Cut Research on how we're going to deal with your father's Alzheimer's. Cut that stuff, but don't mess with my money. Boy, oh boy, they redefine greed every day, don't they? But we can't stand for it, and we will not stand for it. And we are the many, and they are the money. We are going to win this fight if we stick to it. If we don't back down, we will be able to take care of business. And I'm telling you, just like we have excise taxes on risky behavior, you know, alcohol and cigarettes and stuff like that. It makes sense to put an excise tax, a small one, 50 basis points on stocks, 10 on basis points on bonds, 0.05 basis points on derivatives. That is less than a mother would pay in the sales tax on groceries. That is less than a father would pay on new school clothes for kids. A trade of $10,000 in stock would pay a tax of 50 bucks. And for 10000 on a bond would be $10. And this is a wafer-thin tax, which enables us to raise revenue we need to strengthen our families and our communities and our nation. And let me just tell you, it would help our markets. It wouldn't hurt them. A financial tax would restore financial markets to productive job-creating investments. A, a financial tax would create jobs by investing in infrastructure and education and health. A financial tax would provide assistance to uh, people who are suffering in poverty all around the world. And also, it could address climate. A financial transaction tax would be a good thing. And it would help this nation. And more than anything else, it would, be a ta it would remind Wall Street that it is the prerogative of the people of the United States to make them abide by regulations that are good and in the public interest. It will remind Wall Street, that the people of the United States are the ones who decide what taxes and how much they're going to pay. And we have got to claim this prerogative and this authority for ourselves. Because after all, this is a democ democ democracy. This is a democratic country. And democracy means rule of the people. The people. So people, get ready to rule. Time for purpose, for news to serve us. Not with propaganda they use to hurt 